black and brown bodies are not necessarily highly valued as other bodies. When I I read Paul and I read Paul saying, you know, I bear the marks of Jesus in my body, that makes me think something a little bit deeper than does he have stigmata? The idea of bearing the marks of Jesus in my body actually links me back to Jesus who's died on a cross that is a Roman imperial cross. Welcome to The Paulcast, a podcast all about the Apostle Paul, curated by Kurt Willems and available online at paulcast.org. On each episode, we ask, who was Paul really? Listen along as Kurt engages with interesting thinkers, innovative practitioners, captivating books, groundbreaking academic theories, and relevant cultural issues to build bridges between the 1st and 21st centuries. This show is an invitation to rethink everything you were taught about this infamous apostle. The pool we excavate from the rubble of tradition might just surprise us all. I want to welcome you back to the Paul Cast. I'm your curator, Kurt Willems, and this podcast is part of a larger network of resources and soon to be more podcasts called theologycurator.com. Hope you'll go check out that site. It's new. It's going to have more and more fresh content through the next following weeks and months. And it's really your source of information regarding this show and all the other great projects and resources. And in fact, I highly, highly encourage you to go there and join our newsletter. In the past, the newsletter was all about going to um, receive essentially the updates for new episodes. And that was it. It really just functioned as an alternative to your subscription to iTunes or something like that. That is no longer the case. We are creating a resource newsletter that will go out weekly We will keep you up to date on things like the latest articles on the website, as well as the latest podcast episodes. And so I highly encourage you to join the hundreds of people already who have hopped on that newsletter. And um, because I'm going to be promoting things like crazy through there, not in a spammy way, I assure you, I have no intention of spamming your inbox, but in a way that leads you to more resources for intelligent and humanizing conversations about Paul, Jesus, the New Testament, and faith in general. On that note, I should also say that you're going to see content there from guest contributors and other folks and other voices who are Friends of mine who have something to say in an area that they're passionate about. You're going to see more things on spiritual formation and faith formation. You're going to see things on church planting. I'm even going to start sharing resources on how to start your own podcast and maybe help you understand some ideas for growing social media and these sorts of things. If you've ever wanted to start an online ministry, even have plans in the works for some e-courses and all kinds of different things that I really want to take my resourcing of regular folks uh, like me uh, to the next level. I, I love just pointing people to excellent resources. That's actually my passion. That's why I podcast. That's why I write. That's why I do what I do as a pastor. I love pointing people to the best resources out there to help them grow in their understanding of God, Jesus, the New Testament, et cetera. And so let me be that resource for you. But I also want to be a resource that's broader than the categories we've touched on so far. Thus, Theology Curator was born. Well, friends, today we have an awesome, awesome interview that I'm just so excited. Dr. Angela Parker, who is an assistant professor of biblical studies at the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology here in Seattle, Um, hence the name Seattle School, right? It's a great place. I have several folks that are part of my congregation who attend there. My sister (laughs) attends there. This is a place that I really believe in. And so um, I think you're going to hear why as you hear from Angela and some of the things she's going to say about Paul and the New Testament that will blow your mind, especially when it comes to race and these sorts of issues. Before we jump to that interview, let me remind you about our sponsor, Fresno Pacific Biblical Seminary and their Master of Arts in Ministry, Leadership and Culture. 
an experience that's facilitated by the excellent staff and faculty that I sat under as a seminary student, as well as some guest faculty like Bruxy Cavey, Brian Zond, Greg Boyd, bringing you a curated seminary experience to your home. Um, it's not as though you are completely a self-starter in the situation. You are actually part of a cohort of learners from around the world, and you get to know these folks. They become friends. In fact, one of the people on my staff has become friends with someone and went out of state just to go on a hiking trip with them. So this is the kind of thing that happens in a program like this beyond learning about spiritual formation, ministry, entrepreneurship, and uh, theology. So if you've ever wanted to go to seminary, but can't make the move, can't get away from work, this, this is kind of the thing for you. This is for folks with jobs and families and all of those things that come up that may be challenging to pause your life. So don't pause your life, live your life and do seminary this way. Fresno Pacific Biblical Seminary and their Master of Arts, this is how you get to it fpu.edu slash paulcast. That's fpu.edu slash paulcast. And it's with that, my friends, that we now transition into this interview with Dr. Angela Parker. I honestly think you are going to dig what she has to say in Galatians. I want to welcome you to this special episode of the Paulcast. I'm Kurt Willems, and I'm actually sitting with Angela Parker in a digital setting, and we are excited to have you with us. Angela is a prof- uh, assistant professor of biblical studies at the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. Is that correct? Did I say that all right? Yes, you did. That's absolutely correct. Thank you. Hey, awesome. Awesome. Well, welcome to the show. Excited to have you with us today. I'm so excited to be here, Kurt. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, a little bit of backstory. I have a bunch of people who uh, go to my church who are part of the Seattle School, and all I hear about is, Kurt, you need to know Dr. Parker. You need to talk to Dr. <laughs> Parker. Dr. Parker, do- you know, and uh, and I'm like, I know, I know. And I, so I'm so glad we're finally having this conversation. I am as well. <laughs> uh, it's like, they're like, you're kindred spirits and don't even know it. And I'm like, okay, well... She likes Paul and she likes subverting some empire. We'll talk. It'll we'll be cool. talk. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so Angela, pleasure yes. to finally make this happen. And um, I, I ask this of a lot of first time guests. I, I simply invite uh, guests to talk to us about why you study the New Testament. How how did you become someone who does this professionally? Not just a Christian who reads the Bible, but reads the Bible for like the deeper meaning stuff. I mean, that is a very much a calling in some sense. And so tell us about how, how you got into new Testament studies. All right. I appreciate that question. I'm actually an ordained Baptist minister and (laughs) I will say that for a few hot minutes, I pastored and I realized I never wanted to do that again, but (laughs) Good, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and not to say the pastoral pastoral work is a bad thing. I pastor in other areas, so I'm I'm very pleased and honored to do the pastoring that I do. However, to pastor in a church setting was not for me, but I was always gifted at teaching. And because I felt God's call in my life to teach, I decided to first of all, go back and do community college and go back and then do my bachelor's and then keep going and do a master's degree. And the interesting thing about doing my master's degree was I could often see that professors in my master's program tended to shuttle African-American students towards theology instead of biblical studies. Hmm. And the interesting aspect of that was, and this is how they would always say it, they say, they would whisper it. You, you don't want to do Bible. And I'd be like, why? And they'd say, well, you know, there's a lot of languages and languages oh, are really hard. Oh, <laughs> no, no. Yes. Oh, <laughs> that, I want to just hit a wall right now. Are you kidding me? No, that is oh. that is a story that a lot of us in Bible who are African-American have, have heard and, and can tell over and over again because... Oh. 
that's the thing. Languages, if, if you look at any PhD program, you have to do Greek, you have to do Hebrew, you have to do German, French, or and even for Hebrew Bible studies, you have to do Aramaic. So that hurdle tends to keep people out of biblical studies and think or focus mostly on the- theology. And I'm the type of person that as soon as someone tells me that I can't do something or I shouldn't do something, then that really sets me on the road to do it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah. that's that's how that happened. And the other interesting aspect of my life personally was, as I said, I was called into ministry, but I went into ministry prior to going back to school and getting even my bachelor's degree. Because in the history of the United States, we have we have split denominations. And so African-Americans had to license and ordain their own ministers in their own traditions because we were split. American Baptists had, had split with Southern Baptists. And so all these dynamics happening within the church then, of course, allowed me to, to be ordained in my Black Baptist tradition, but again, without formal education. And because I I knew I wanted that formal education, I decided to go to college and then a master's program and then a PhD. So that's what started me on this yeah. journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's what a what a great I, I mean, great in the sense that it's illuminating for a lot of us. You know, I'm a white male guy, so no one has ever said to me, as I've considered going the full PhD eventually, you know, mm-hmm. no one's ever said to me, you know, Kurt. Um, I'm concerned that you might not be able to do A, B, or C. You, you know what I mean? Right, like yes. at least not in the like biased way that you're talking. Oh, it's, <laughs> it, 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 it's it's one of those areas though that actually strengthens strengthens me. Mm. And I often tell the story to students in class that talks about sitting in Greek classes and professors really having a difficult time with understanding that, yes, I do know Greek and I do know Hebrew and I can sit and translate with the best of them. So mm. that, that don't limit, don't limit students just because of, you know, preconceived notions. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think for me, especially as a, as a professor now, I try to say, you can do this to any student. You can do this. Yeah. Yeah, because I want to be the professor that I did not have during my master's program. Oh, that's that, that's beautiful. I mean, yeah, that's uh, yeah, those voices in in the journey are so important. And so yes. I know um, I can tell you personal stories of uh, students who have talked to you and have said very similar things. So that's that's really cool oh, to hear. Uh, yeah, yeah, and. Uh, you know, today now. Oh, before I forget, so you did a master's. Where did you do a, a PhD program? Oh, PhD work is always so much fun. I started yeah. my PhD at Union Theological Seminary in New York City, mm-hmm. and then I transferred from Union to Chicago Theological Seminary. Oh, and so a transfer from one PhD program to another PhD program is is. Not something that usually happens. And so the interesting aspect of that, I I love my time at Union Theological Seminary. I've made some very good friends at Union Theological Seminary. A lot of schools, though, are are interesting places. Mm. And that was one interesting place that... Had it not been for the the encouragement of James Cone, I would not have been able to transfer from Union to Chicago Theological Seminary. So I, that's one other aspect of my journey. I do credit Dr. James Cone with allowing me and, and giving me the, the strength and the unction to make a change when parts of my PhD program at Union were not conducive for me. And I will say this, I'm, I'm a womanist New Testament scholar. A womanist is a, she can be defined as a black feminist. However, I, I personally do not hold to the black feminist nomenclature. Mm -hmm. I'd Mm -hmm. rather identify as womanist. And 
thinking about what it means to read the New Testament as a womanist really takes into consideration my own lived experiences as a Black woman, as a Black female. And Dr. James Cone was very instrumental in allowing me to, to think about that and then think about a better place for me to be able to do that type of work. Because mm. not every place can can encourage or nurture a Black woman to study the New Testament through her own lived experience. Yeah. Yeah. No, so that's... CPS allowed that. No, that's... Chicago uh, Theological Seminary allowed that, I should say. That, that, that's, uh, that's so fascinating. And, and Dr. James Cohn, of course, has had a huge influence on a lot of us. And yes. uh, especially, you know, for me, opening my eyes to things that I just wouldn't see on my own, you yes. know? And mm -hmm. uh, so is he, just so I remember, was he at Union while you were at Union? Yes. Or, okay, He's I got been you. at Union for a long time. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. And, uh, and so you finished up in Chicago and... So I've already kind of said what you're doing today, but mm -hmm. yeah, so you can talk about that a little bit. Sure. Uh, yeah. So I finished my PhD at Chicago Theological Seminary in 2015 and made the, the transition from being a doctoral student to being assistant professor here at the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. So I was really fortunate to graduate and immediately move into a, po a post. Yeah. Um. I, 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 I'm very thankful. I'm very grateful for being able to do that. Uh, I have a lot of friends who were not able to make that transition as quickly or make, made the transition a few, a few years later. So I'm really fortunate to step into teaching at this graduate institution and helping to just open up and restore or reconnect folks to the to the study of the New Testament. I think one thing that's interesting about my position at the Seattle School tends to come from my interaction with students who have been so hurt or damaged by the New Testament or even by Hebrew Bible. And to be able to be a voice that says, yes, there have been some aspects of this text that are damaging or hurtful, but what does it look like to re-engage to re-engage the biblical text and find liberation, find hope, find some type of restoration that does not automatically lead to the damnation of a people. Yes. And for me, especially from an African-American standpoint, I, I talked about teaching and preaching in Black Baptist churches. And one of the most horrible experiences for me as a teacher in the Black Baptist church was to hear African Americans say, well, aren't we supposed to be less than because of the curse of Ham? And I'd say, wait, you're saying that just because of the color of your skin, you, you shouldn't you should not flourish in this world. Hmm. I, I know. I, and for some, that was one of the aspects that propelled me into, into this study, into wanting to be able to engage the both Hebrew Bible and new Testament in such a way that that is flourishing for life, because that mindset is still a mindset, a mindset that, runs rampant in churches. And I just can't see a good and gracious God who allows us to think anything less of ourselves than being made and created in his image. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. know that's, that's, uh, I mean, that story is, I, I want to say shocking, is, but I, I think more as I've sit, I'm sitting with it is just painful to hear yes. that that is the legacy. Um, of this country has led mm -hmm. to these um, folks who are beautiful and made in this God's image, who uh, still wrestle with value, still wrestle with worth. Um, yes. And uh, I, I think it's wonderful that there's voices like yours that are speaking into that and saying, no, 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 there's a better word here. There's a yes. better truth here. Yes, um, definitely. Yeah. There has yeah. to be. Right. There has to be. Oh man. Well, I, I know that I'm anxious and I, I think others are excited right now to hear 
more about your work. You uh, clearly have an excellent kind of background and have some just uh, uh, tools that you have developed that are just uh, the envy of many people. I mean, dealing with language and all these things, like not very many people do that stuff. And so it, it's awesome. So now uh, one of the things we're talking about here is sort of your interest in Pauline studies. And mm. uh, my understanding is that you've done some time thinking about Paul and race and identity and these sorts of issues. I'd love to hear just some of uh, that talked about, if you yeah. don't mind. Oh, of course not. I appreciate that. Oh, I think that my move to Paul stems from my own grandmother. And there's also the legendary story of Howard Thurman's grandmother. Howard Thurman is was an African American mystic and mm. did a lot of theological writing. And Thurman relays the story of his grandmother who would never read any of the Pauline writings. And she would not read Paul because most of the sermons that enslaved folks heard during slavery were, they stem from the idea of slaves be obedient to your masters. They, they came from a lot of the household codes of Paul. Right. So the Deutero-Pauline literature, when I say Deutero-Pauline, I mean probably not authentic Paul. Right. And as a result, African Americans have tended to stay away from Paul and only rely on gospels. Hmm. So for me, I'm often thinking, well, what does it look like to re-engage Paul, again, in a way that's liberating and not so damaging to the history of slavery within the United States of America? And what I do is read Galatians. I tend to read Galatians hmm. a little bit more than Romans, even though I think I will move to Romans, but I'm not, not there yet because I've been right. working on Galatians for a, a long period of time. And hopefully have an article coming out in a journal soon that maybe people can post somewhere. I don't know. Hey, nice, <laughs> nice. I'm sure, I'm sure it'll get picked up. That's, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So what I do is I read uh, Galatians and I think about Paul's self-identity. And I think about Paul's identity as a Jewish man. I think about Paul's self-identification as a slave to Christ. I think about Paul's self-identification as a mother as well, because mm. in Romans and Galatians and other parts of, of the Pauline text, he usually likens himself to giving birth to people. And as I'm thinking about these various identities of Paul, I'm thinking about these identities in relationship to mothers today, especially mothers who are birthing children, but seeing those children killed, shot, incarcerated as a result of state violence. And when you think about the Pauline literature, and this is where empire criticism comes in. Mm -hmm. Paul is writing at a time where the Roman Empire is the the be all end all of of governance. And one thing that empire critical scholars are are playing with a little bit more is the idea of law behind Paul. So when mm -hmm. Paul is talking about law, is he just talking about Jewish law? Or is there a way to see where Paul distinguishes between Jewish law or Roman imperial law? And so Galatians is an interesting test case because in Galatia, you have representation of Roman imperial law all throughout the, the region of Galatia yes. or modern day Turkey. And if Paul was in Galatia and saw some of the representations of Roman imperial law, is that part of the background of his writing? It could be. And so for me, I kind of nuance Paul's own understanding of himself and then link that into our own ideas of law and violence today, especially with regards to being a 
mother who has birthed children into this world. And now also looking at my own child, my own children, I have two children grown. Mm. They think they're grown, but they're grown. I'll, I'll call them grown. <laughs> no, they are grown. <laughs> but they, I have a three-year-old granddaughter and now a two-month-old grandson. And I see my children wrestling with what it means to raise African-American children in today's day and age, knowing that black and brown bodies are not necessarily highly valued as other bodies. Right. So when I, I read Paul and I read Paul saying, you know, I bear the marks of Jesus in my body, that makes me think something a little bit deeper than does he have stigmata or what, what is he yeah, talking about? Yeah. And so for contemporary Christians, especially contemporary African-American female Christians or others who may identify as womanists, the idea of bearing the marks of Jesus in my body actually links me back to Jesus who's died on a cross that is a Roman imperial cross. Mm -hmm. And so that then makes me think, well, if I'm bearing the marks of Jesus on my body, or if Paul says he's bearing the marks of Jesus on his body, is he talking about the imperial violence that Jesus went through? And if we're looking around the United States today, we're seeing state-sanctioned violence and we're seeing Ooh. mothers crying out for for also bearing the marks of, of their children children's dying in yeah. this country. So I think that there's something there regarding Paul's self-identification and my own self-identification as a womanist mother. Oh, yeah. Drop the mic there. Let's be done. I mean, <laughs> seriously, that what uh, I mean, you're bringing up so many amazing points. Uh, I mean, but yeah, bearing the marks of Jesus and and seeing yeah, black and brown bodies, undervalued, mm -hmm. uh, dying, uh, murdered, you know, like, oh, yes. Yes. That, that is such such an insightful moment, I think, for a lot of people uh, who, who hopefully are listening to this, because that that does frame it in empire. You know, we talk about trying to build bridges between the first and the 21st century. And, mm -hmm. and friends, if you're you're listening to Angela as she is talking this is exactly that work it's empire then empire now and yes. identify identification with a crucified messiah at the margins of the empire and here are folks dying at the margins of our streets you know and what a exactly oh that's just that that's good hermeneutic oh man and <laughs> and I appreciate that. oh no oh my gosh and and your your other point about the law in Galatians and um, how Paul, at least in some way, shape or form, is also thinking about Roman imperial law. Is that does that come out of um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, what was that book called that I really loved? Uh, Galatians. Galatians Reimagined. Re oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, one of my favorites. <laughs> we, we talk about the radical Paul around here and we talk about the. Paul within Judaism type Paul and mm -hmm. uh, that series of books, uh, yes, Paul in yes. critical context, I think mm -hmm. is what that series is. It's just so helpful. So yes, it is. Yeah. And so I would recommend that book, Galatians Reimagine, and also, um, oh goodness, Davina Lopez's book as well, Apostle Ooh. to the Conquered, and yeah. also um, the Colonized Apostle. Very mm -hmm. good work on thinking about Paul in the Roman imperial context and, and what that means for us, especially today when we're thinking about engaging Jesus as the crucified Messiah and what it means for us. And that's the thing. We've, we've taken the idea of Jesus and individualized and done so much personal salvation that we've lost connection with other people. And I think that's what that work is setting us up to do. Yeah. And so for me, I take it a step further and really add the idea of race and gender a little bit more to that in order to make it a little bit more, more, if you, if you were sitting with me right now, you'd see, I have my hands in the air saying <laughs> something like more gritty, more, more connective. And that, yeah. that's what, that's what we're trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do at least. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a, that's a 
very helpful framing and uh and it's important right like if we want to hear the echoes of real people on the ground like what life was like on the ground for a galatian jesus person yes we have to hear the voices that push against our our biases our privilege you know Mm -hmm. and and be able to at least start to glimpse into stories and narratives like your own you know um and and so how has um you know as you think about paul and race and these sorts of issues uh, obviously we're talking about empire criticism uh, talk to us about like how you've wrestled with paul's own understanding of his own judaism and maybe mm-hmm. the judaism uh that he's you know dealing with in different contexts um, we have to, you know, the, the basic labels, new perspective, yes. all, within, right, all these labels, blah, blah, blah. So, so how does some of Paul's own understanding of Judaism, as you understand Paul, play into some of this racial conversation that you're seeing drawing out of uh, Galatians and elsewhere? Yes, I, I think I would say that Paul is a contextual thinker. And that's one thing that we have to always keep in mind, that what scholars like to do is to take the whole the whole Pauline corpus and try to make some kind of systematic theology of Paul. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that that can be done necessarily. I think that Paul in certain contexts plays up his Judaism or in other contexts may not play it up as much. Mm. And when we're reading various portions of the of of the Pauline corpus, I think we just have to be mindful of that. But the other thing is, Paul understood, I think, his identity, of course, from his Jewish identity. I don't think he ever gave up his Jewish identity. I think that stayed with him no matter what. So I I would say that I'm part new perspective on Paul and really holding holding on to his Jewish identity. But I would say that I may lean a little bit towards a radical understanding of Paul's Judaism along the lines. Now, I'll say this. I don't think I go all the way to the side of a Pamela Eisenbaum, Mm -hmm. but I think that I I tend to follow Love Seacrest's work at, Mm. at Fuller. She talks about Paul kind of thinking about Christians as a new race. I'm not necessarily sure he does that in all of his work. I think he does that in some of his work. So I think that Paul held on to his Judaism, but played with an idea of what early Jesus follower Christian identity may may be. Hmm. So I think he played with it. I don't think he ever got to the point where he would definitely say that there is quote unquote a new race of of people who are now Jesus followers but I think that in some parts of his corpus he's playing with the idea yeah yeah no I I, I would echo that and in fact uh I love how you said you're you like Pamela Eisenbaum but not quite as far as she goes that's exactly how I would describe my own thinking right like yeah yeah uh, I I certainly you know, because you get into some interesting questions is, uh, mm-hmm. does Paul have any desire for Jewish folks to find Jesus in the first century? And I, I right. want to say, I think so. I, I think actually, so, right. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't think he wants them to stop circumcising the boys and mm-hmm. stop following Torah. There's this dance between Torah is good for Jewish folks, but but and and the identity and everything that comes with that. Yes. But the yoke of Jesus as new interpreter of Torah also has some weight here. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and yeah, I, I think you know there's uh, in Ephesians, which is Deutero Paul most likely. Uh, yeah. You definitely get this sense of like in one new humanity. But even there, I, I don't have the sense that if Paul is behind Ephesians in some way, shape, or form, I don't. I don't get the sense that it's like, therefore, your current identities no longer are important. It's it's kind of like a both and maybe. And they both have this like, there's this important dance that is happening there. I I don't know. Um, So so in that light, what do you sense that this Paul, as he dances around identity, has something to say to the church today as we try and figure out our own sort of like racial 
identities within this larger thing we call the North, I mean, just in North America, yeah. right? The North yeah. American church, yet, you know, yet alone the mm -hmm. broader community. Like, what what does that stir up in a womanist scholar like yourself as you sit with those issues? Yeah, I think for me, I go to Romans, and this is where I do, I, I think that Paul, in his language of, and this occurs in 1 Corinthians as well, in his language of the body of Christ, mm -hmm. I think that the body of Christ for Paul can take up all of these various identities. I think that the body of Christ can include all of these various identities. I think that even with taking up all of our identities into the body of Christ, we still remain part, we still remain in our particular identity, but we're still all a part of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I actually go to, to revelation and I see John, the revelator saying something about, well, you know, I looked and I saw all sorts of people from all nations, all languages, all tongues, and they're all here just worshiping the lamb. And so I think that for Paul, there's, there's enough in the body of Christ to, to take up all of our identities and still be a part of the body of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is, that is extremely extremely helpful. I mean, and it seems like as a good Pharisaic Jew that this would have to be a big deal, especially for like Paul, right? Because mm -hmm. he he thinks the vision of Isaiah has come to pass. Exactly. Right? Like yes. the nations are streaming in yes. to worship Israel's God. Right. Yes. It's not it's not the nations are streaming in to become Israelites. It's not the uh, the opposite that the nations come in. So the Israelites become less Israel, Israeli or whatever. Right. Exactly. It's, right. <laughs> it's, there is this distinction yet oneness. Um, mm -hmm. and, and to deconstruct those categories, I think doesn't really do justice to uh, that prophetic vision. Exactly. Or to try to make everybody unified. Um, yeah. you can, you can have unity, but still be diverse. And I think that's the point. Instead yeah. of trying to make everything monochromatic or make everybody like everyone else, I think that's a disservice to to even the the Trinitarian nature of God, mm -hmm. that there's still that diversity, but still some unity within that diversity. And I think that's that's what the vision is. No, that's yeah. that's that's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. Well, as, uh, yeah, as we kind of move towards the back end of our conversation, um, I'm definitely going to be anxious to follow some of the stuff that you're going to be working on and all of this. I mean, and, and by the way, how incredible, oh, I didn't realize that your, uh, your, your post at the Seattle school mm -hmm. was, um, right out of a PhD program. I mean, how, how exciting is that? I that's, mean, that's very that's, exciting. Yeah. It was so, very exciting for me. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Um, what did, uh, so I, I don't think we really asked this, but your, your PhD project, what, um, what was the theme or the big idea that you worked with, um, in that setting? Yeah. So my PhD, work is entitled Bodies, Violence, and Emotions, mm. a womanist study of Soma, which is body, and Potoma, which is dead body, in the Gospel of Mark. So I, I'm a Markan scholar, but again, it goes back to the idea of thinking about Jesus's body, Jesus's Soma, and his Potoma, his fallen body, or his dead body, or corpse, however you want to translate it, and linking that to the hemorrhaging woman of Mark chapter 5. Ooh. The sco scholars have noted that the text of Mark 5 with the hemorrhaging woman has many parallels to the text of the of Jesus's crucifixion that there are some patterns, linguistic mm. patterns there, but no one's done anything with it. What I've done is I've basically likened the hemorrhaging woman's body to the body of Jesus on the cross and argued that within her body, she's suffered some of the same imperial violence that Jesus is suffering on the cross, which then allows me to think now a few years later about Paul in that, in that way as well. So my mark in work has propelled me to the Pauline work that I'm doing in order to think about the imperial violence that bodies have suffered in 
in the Roman imperial context. So that's my basic argument in my work, and that's under contract with Whippenstock. So when that comes out, I will let you know. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So, so the the book on Mark is in contract, right? Wow, awesome. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do a lot of Jesus studies per se on this show. But <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> no, 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 it's beautiful because I've got I've got a, a shelf or two of some historical Jesus type stuff. I just uh, you know one at a time in here. So uh, um, maybe eventually we'll start the Jesus cast or something too, and we can <laughs> Sounds go into depth about that one. But I mean, I think it's cool to see how how entering into that world, whether it's through the lens of uh, Mark or Paul, right? Mm -hmm. Like this yes. is a very real thing throughout the New Testament. Empire shadow looms large. And yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, no, so I can definitely see the parallel. That makes perfect sense. Um, do you have a, a approximation date for when that's coming out or is that still kind of being figured out? Still being figured out. Don't worry. I will let you know. <laughs> hey, right on. Right on. Love that. Love that. Well, um, Angela, I, I guess as we get ready to wrap up here, um, if folks wanted to track you down, do you have a, a website? I know that sounds creepy, right? They want to track you down. But, um, <laughs> they want to kind of follow some of the developments in your work. Is there a way that they can uh, connect with you? I, you know, the interesting thing about being a, a quote unquote scholar, which is interesting to me as I think about my life now, I'm a, a biblical scholar. <laughs> <I'm>, yeah. <laughs> we tend to be slow with developing websites, so oh, I'm yeah. going to get yeah. better with developing a website. But of course, you can always find me at the Seattle School So perfect. you'll see my perfect, not my perfect, but my updated <laughs> information always there. <laughs> And you can be perfect too. That's all good. <laughs> oh man. Well, no, that's that's great. And uh, for anyone listening, um, I know from personal experience that the Seattle School does a lot of um, great work, both in scholarship and in creativity and in psychology. I mean, they've yes. the, the Seattle School is this integrative, beautiful place, and so really I definitely is. would recommend it as an option if you're thinking through seminary and vocation or even psychology stuff. Um, yes. I think it's just a gift. Yes, yeah. it is. It's a such a pleasure to be here in Seattle and just to engage with such a, a dynamic and integrative community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Angela, for hanging out on the show. And um, we'll look forward to hearing more about your work as it progresses. And um, we'll, we'll invite you back because this was awesome. This is so much fun. This was so much fun. Thank you so much, Kurt. Hey, thank you. All right. Did you catch it? There were a couple of bomb drops in this interview. I called it out in the middle of the episode, but I want you to just sit with some of the connections she made to the suffering Christ under empire and black folks who are being persecuted and dying in the streets. And, and if you are Caucasian, like myself, you're a white person and um, don't know how to identify with the black situation, and, and maybe you heard some of what she said and said, oh, that goes against my political grid or that goes against my experience. Well, of course, it goes against our experience because we're white and we have a, a different set of opportunities and resources and lenses that were uh, just natural to us, but are not intuitive of everyone's situation. And so I, I invite you to let this interview linger and provoke you to ask hard questions and that, that, my friends, is good because we need to be willing to step out of our box of experience to experience in solidarity at the very minimum what other folks experience. And sometimes it's much harder than our situation. And so I just love this interview. It continues to expose the fact that Jesus died for those who find themselves marginalized, excluded, and whoever you are, if you've ever experienced marginalization, exclusion, if you've ever experienced the sense that your situation was different than so many others who have it better, or maybe you've just felt like certain people said, you're not good enough. Well, that's my, <laughs> that, that's what Jesus does. He dies 
in solidarity with those folks. He dies to liberate all of us, oppressor and oppressed, from the need to be in slavery to those sorts of systems and mentalities and human interactions. So Dr. Angela Parker, I hope you're listening. I, I just want to tell you again, thank you so much for your wisdom in this episode. Let me also, before we go, uh, remind you of Fresno Pacific Biblical Seminary and their Master of Arts in Ministry, Leadership, and Culture, a great program. Hop in and get into one of those cohorts. It's going to be worth it for you in so many ways. fpu.edu slash paulcast. That's fpu.edu slash paulcast. And finally, let me just tell you one more time that theologycurator.com is now live. That's where you get all your information about Paulcast. Of course, our paulcast.org still works, but it will redirect you over to there. And there's some really cool features. One of them is you can leave a voice recording with your question or comment to me. And um, it's one of those things that if you leave me a concise question, it may end up on the podcast. Yeah, like your voice might actually be mixed into one of these episodes and um, we might have an opportunity to actually interact digitally in that way. So I really hope that you will take advantage of the voice recording feature. It's one of my favorite features that has not yet been utilized. So be the first besides, well, me to try it out. Okay. Finally, I hope uh, you are having a great week and I hope that the thoughts and reflections of this episode provoke you to see the world differently, to see Jesus differently, and ultimately to say, I am going to be a voice for the voiceless. I am going to move and breathe with the Holy Spirit in solidarity with those who suffer, with those who have less privilege, and I am going to be part of a conversation that is both intelligent and humanizing in a world that would rather divide and conquer. Have a great day, my friends. Until next time, this is The Paulcast. Thanks for listening to The Paulcast. For more resources from Kurt Willems, check out paulcast.org and sign up for our email update list. For new listeners of the podcast, we hope you will subscribe via iTunes, Google, or your podcast manager of choice. For regular listeners, consider supporting the Paulcast at paulcast.org forward slash support. For questions about Paul or other issues about the New Testament, record a question directly on our website as a voice message. If you do, we might feature it on the show. Also, feel free to leave feedback about how this podcast is making an impact on you. Lastly, please don't let this conversation end when the episode is over. We hope you feel empowered in regular life to talk about Jesus, Paul and the New Testament in intelligent and humanising ways. 